It is the pastor's heart and Dominic Steele. And thanks for joining us today, improving our application with Paul Grimmond. And we have a problem. Speaking of theological college students in their final year preaching assignments, a lecturer said, it's like they got their exegesis spot on, closed their eyes, fired an arrow randomly into the air, opened their eyes to see where it landed and said, that looks like a good place to do application. And look, there's a question. If that's what they're saying about the students, what about those of us who've graduated from theological college and who are modeling to the students what to do? There is a nervousness in the air, though, about application. And Paul Grimmond is Dean of Students at Sydney's Moore Theological College. He's just completed a Doctor of Ministry assignment on improving application in preaching. Paul, that is a devastating quote, but it does ring true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's slightly sad in some ways, isn't it? And I want to say it's it's not across the board. It's not like every single student is like that. And oh, like in it any sounds place, like that, the way you there, quoted there, it. There, there's a range of things. But I, I do think it represents something that kind of comes from our, our tribal school, if you want to kind of put it like that, that where we're very, very keen to get the Bible dead on on and dead right and there's a real nervousness about doing application mm -hmm. um, so we spend lots of our time on exegesis we spend lots of time being able to communicate this passage really accurately to people and get it right and the, th but the commentaries are really big on getting the exegesis a absolutely. right absolutely yeah. yeah yeah and and lots of the process of learning at college is really about that end and please you know i want to say up front i'm really for that mm -hmm. <laughs> i think that that's a great thing i think that the argument in my thesis is that just that if that's where you stop, you haven't tried to do what God's actually trying to do in Scripture. And I think what God calls us to as preachers and pastors and people. Mm. What's the difference between a lecture in theological college and a sermon in church? Yeah, is it the difference between that exegesis? Well, I, like I, I do I wonder about that, or I think it depends what subject you're in and what the lecture looks like, and et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, but I think... Um, We've inherited a background educationally um, where theory is, is much more important than practice. So historically, and this isn't just theological colleges, I think this is our whole kind of Western education mm -hmm. system. Theory is pure and neat and it's the thing that you get right. And if you get it right, everything else will follow because everything else is downstream mm -hmm. from that, so mm -hmm. to speak. Um, I think one of the things that I'm arguing for in the thesis is that the skill of moving from comprehending your theory to working out what that means in the concrete realities of people's lives is another separate set of skills that if you don't practice it, isn't something that you end up being able to do very well at mm. all. Mm. Yeah. You pick a couple of conversation partners, one of whom, a friend of mine, and uh, he describes a week where I ran out of time I didn't have enough time to do the hard work in the text and I ended up, um, well, preaching a, a talk that had lots more application at the end. And then at the end, people said, oh, that was great. You spoke to my life. And he, he said, I'm then off in a tussle of should I go back to where I do all the hard work or should I stay just landing in people's lives? And as I read his article, I thought, actually, he does reflect my tribe of thinking. Yeah, I, I think we feel deep tension, don't we? So um, we understand that I really want to know what Paul said to the Galatians, for example. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to just, and that's part of the problem with the kind of closing my eyes and pinging the arrow off mm -hmm. <laughs> into space. I've got the exegesis right. I don't quite know how that relates to reality. Let me find mm. somewhere and kind of rumble around. But... Um, if what the Bible says about what God is doing through Scripture, which is actually transforming me, um, he's saving me, he's transforming my heart and mind, he's actually making me someone who lives their whole life wholeheartedly under the Lordship of Jesus, then we ought to actually expect Scripture to kind of modify our behaviour and our beliefs and our affections. It's poking us in all of those places mm -hmm. all the time to change and transform people. Mm -hmm. And if we're thinking about what, how does that change take place, what happens there, certainly God's spirit is at work, but the truth of scripture is being worked into our experience and in our way of understanding the world. And that means actually engaging with how these truths from the Bible affect my day-to-day -day experience as a lawyer or a school teacher or uh, as a parent or you know, one of any other thousand things that we can name in that mm. space. Yeah. How, what sort of application then are you arguing we should engage in? 
Well, I, if I want to go back one step, Dominic, I yeah. think I would say that my argument is really that the Bible, um, what's the Bible doing? Um, the truth about who God is and who Jesus is is the same, and it's constant all the way through Scripture. Mm -hmm. But the Apostle Paul didn't write one letter with 37 interesting points about God and Jesus and kind of get the scribes to work because mm -hmm. he didn't have a photocopier and kind of mm. send that to the churches throughout. He addresses different churches in different circumstances of life, saying if you were someone who loved Jesus and had been saved by him and were a follower of him, these are the kinds of theological truths you'd grab for in this space in order to respond to these kinds of issues. Mm -hmm. In a sense, the, the Bible is kind of apprenticing you um, to, to work out what are the intuitions and beliefs and affections and practices that characterize the Christian life. And it does it by putting you in different concrete contexts and then inviting you to think about how those things interrelate and form a set of beliefs and affections um, and and behaviors that are genuinely Christian that genuinely live out your life under the Lordship of Jesus okay you've argued that where's that in the Bible <laughs> <laughs> well that, I mean that's a great question um, f for me there's a couple of passages that were really significant for me in writing the thesis mm -hmm. so I found I find Titus 2 really fascinating in that he says teach what's in accord with sound doctrine there in chapter 2 verse 1 and then the whole rest of the chapter you, I mean, I'm theologically trained I'm thinking what's in accord with sound doctrine it's atonement, all practical application. atonement <laughs> ecclesiology <laughs> you know <laughs> trinity etc 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 and he goes well this is what you should say to the older men about yeah. how they live and this is what you should say to the younger men and these women this is what you should say to them and yeah. and it's and the slaves this is how you should talk to the slaves and it's and all doesn't he finish with the last line teach what's in accord with sound doctrine Absolute, again he kind yes. of tops he, and he tails it basically comes back to that at the very end and at the end of the, the section in verses 11 to 14 there's that beautiful description of the gospel right mm -hmm. where he says the grace of God has appeared and it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and yes to righteousness mm -hmm. um, but right at the end there's that little because you're waiting for Jesus so Jesus has come once mm -hmm. he's coming back again you're living as his servant but what did he come to do? He came, basically, the passage says two things, to redeem you from lawlessness and to purify you to do good works. And so when Paul teaches people about who Jesus is and what his lordship means, that's never divorced from the shape of the Christian life. Mm -hmm. um, knowing what to do as a follower of Jesus isn't just automatic. It's not like we all know exactly what mm -hmm. it's supposed to be. And you just find Jesus and now, of course, you just do the right thing. But there is a reshaping of our hearts and minds and affections. And if you think about the New Testament, right, you think about how often Paul gives you those lists of virtues and vices, or he gets into, you know, in Ephesians 4 and 5, don't lie, let the thief work with his hands and give to his neighbour. The concrete reality of that is part of experiencing and seeing the goodness of what it means to live under the Lordship of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... How do I do it? <laughs> I mean, I mean as, as, as you say that, I think, right, okay, I know what to do if I'm teaching on application in, um, in Titus 2. You've, I've, I've got that clear. Sure. But my personal Bible reading this year has been Jeremiah. Yeah. And I'm up to chapter 25 in Jeremiah, and I'm feeling pretty beaten about <laughs> in Jeremiah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, yeah. and, and I am sort of, and I, I do a little five-minute video every morning um, and I've been saying the same thing in terms of application for pretty much 25 chapters. chapters. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And I'm thinking, wow, I'm glad our church is not teaching through Jeremiah 25 weeks in a row at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a little bit stuck. I, I have a friend who I believe at the end of his series on Jeremiah, his father said to him, that was great. Don't do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, I, I have worked out, I did work out I needed to take a break from Jeremiah just for my own sake. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, part of me wonders whether we need to, we need to be more sensitive to literature. Um, it's not just every book I'm going to do, every chapter of every book. There are sections, there are chunks, there are ways that the scripture works together to shape beliefs and affections and behaviour. So partly it's in something like One and Two Kings, for example. I think mm -hmm. the repetition of the evil and stuff is part of what creates the purpose and yeah. function of what's going on. Mm. Um, but I think what, one of the things that I would invite people to be thinking about, um, when, 
one of my big observations about people when they first start leading Bible study or preaching is that basically you ask them, what are you going to teach from this passage? And they give you a summary of the content of yep. the passage, right? Mm -hmm. And we're very good at that. Yep. Even our like first year university students, when I trained them to how to lead a Bible study group, they could summarize the content of the passage. Yep. But the author didn't write that content in order to share content. The author wrote that content in order to persuade you about something, yeah. to challenge uh, disbelief, to encourage belief, to challenge a certain behavior, to ask you to repent and put off the old self, to put on the new self. He was trying to form in you a person who loved what God loves and hate what God hates mm -hmm. uh, and with a desire to actually live that out and put it into practice in your life. And so when we come to even engaging with the text, where the, the question that we're trying to ask is not just what are the contents of this passage, but what was the author trying to do with the content of this passage in the hearts and minds mm. of the people who were hearing it? So I'm mean, just thinking 2 Timothy 3 is teach, rebuke, correct Re and train. train. Absolutely. And make wise for salvation yep. through faith in Christ Jesus. Yep. But are you saying that I'm doing too much make wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus and not enough teach, rebuke, correct, train? Or I mean, I, I do think that that is our tendency. Um, that I, I mean, there's a, a gospel, you need to come to Christ today. Yeah, to that's talk. right. I mean, Peter, Peter Jensen is this <laughs> lovely little, it's lovely when your biases are supported, aren't they? But um, by, there's by, a, your friends. by your friends. <laughs> um, but Peter kind of says there is a thing that we do with biblical theology, for example, where we say basically everything in the Old Testament is about the, is about forgiveness, it's about the atonement, and so whatever it's saying, you need to be forgiven today. Mm -hmm. Now, there is a deep truth to that, and if that's not the heartbeat, because I think that lies behind the nature of grace, right? Mm -hmm. So if that's not the heartbeat of what we're doing, then we're missing something. But Paul very, very regularly wants to say to people, as someone who has experienced the grace of Jesus, put off the old self, put on the new self, so there's this lovely little, these two little words that I learned from a guy called Dryden um, in a lovely little book called The Hermeneutic of Wisdom, where he talks, the Bible's trying to make the Christian life intelligible and desirable. Mm -hmm. He's trying to make it make sense, and he's trying to help your heart to long for that. There is mm. something good about living with Jesus as Lord. So as I teach you this passage, what I want to do is to show you how the truths in this passage relate to each other, to help you to change your belief, to reinforce something that you have believed or to believe something different from what you believed. I want to challenge you to think about how does this match up with what you're confronted with in the world every day? And how do you cling to this when this is what the people around about you are saying, this is true and this is what's going to be helpful? Just show me, where's that word? I mean, that desire word, where, what's the verse that's in? Or? <laughs> <laughs> well, again, I... Uh, I wouldn't say it's in a particular verse. I mean, it, it but, feels right to me. I just want to... Well, yeah. so I think it's, um, for me, the place, if you go and read some of the Puritans, yeah. um, what they're saying is the ministry of the word is not just to the mind. You're not just trying to give someone cognition. You're trying to shape someone's heart. Yeah. So um, very interestingly, when you look at the list of virtues and vices, Paul doesn't say, look, there are these evil things, jealousy, rage, malice, etc., etc." Mm -hmm. Fix those up by thinking nice thoughts <laughs> mm, yeah. or just change your mind. Yeah. But you're supposed to replace those things with, with love and kindness and generosity and compassion. Well, what, and just, whatever is lovely, whatever is, think about those absolutely. things. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I mean, there's a few key things there. That is, the Bible never separates your mind and heart in the way that we do in mm -hmm. our culture. Your heart thinks and feels. It is either rebellious or it's turned towards God. And your heart is transformed as you actually take on the truth and appropriate it and live it out. Mm -hmm. You know, James, the person who only hears and walks away and does nothing with it, that's it, foolishness. That's complete mm. foolishness. The line in 2 Timothy 3 of teach, rebuke, tr correct and train, and then the that the preachers to do the same thing yeah, in so chapter 4. Chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. So on the very back of said, having said to Timothy, you're living in the last days. 
Um, you have the word of God, which does all of these things. And then he says, he, there's this incredible, the power of it in light of the coming judgment and mm. Jesus return. And what should you do? Preach the word, that famous in season and mm. out of season. But then he uses three words that map almost directly onto the mm. four words that he's used to describe scripture before. Timothy, in relationship with people, do what the Bible is doing mm. in, with them. And what that means is that when I come to preach, it's not me saying, oh, look, this is God saying this. I'm not saying this. Mm. <laughs> Actually, the biblical position of the pastor is I am saying this because God is saying this. So I'm going to exhort you. I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to invite you to be delighted. I'm going to um, speak things that are difficult. I'm going to do that in relationship with you with the scriptures open. Um, but there's not a gap. There's not, I teach you the Bible and then the spirit magically does something that kind of translates that into your reality. Mm. But I'm supposed to preach that truth in a way that convicts, engages, persuades, shapes, remolds you, always, always dependent upon God at work in that space. But that must and can only happen when we actually get concrete, when we start to talk about the ins and outs of people's lives mm. and when these truths become hard to believe or how these truths are so good for people who are struggling and finding life difficult or whatever else it is. We've got to connect the truth of Scripture with people's experience because that's where they live out the reality that Jesus is Lord in their life. It's, Sorry, I'm getting passionate. No, 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 it's good. <laughs> it, it sounds like you've been on a journey on this issue. Oh, I think definitely. Yeah, yeah. And, and you've changed your own practice on this issue as well? I think I have. I think um, it's interesting. I go back and read some of my early sermons mm -hmm. um, and realise that I was very, very keenly involved in getting the exegetical details exactly right. Mm -hmm. And I, wonder, I do wonder whether there is some development that happens in this over any preacher and pastor's life. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, for me now, two decades worth of ins and outs of people's lives has helped me to realise that what I'm teaching in the Bible affects and impacts real people in the real world. But nevertheless, I hope that I haven't stopped working hard at understanding what the text actually says. But I think that as we preach it, there is a move, and I'm going to use very dangerous language here, but I'm using it consciously. Mm -hmm. There is a step beyond the text as you actually bring these truths to bear on the hearts and minds of the people that you're speaking to. It's a, it's a move that's controlled theologically, that's controlled by context, that's controlled by scripture, but it is still a move beyond the text. And I, I think the New Testament does it all the time. Well, let me be vulnerable and you can critique me. <laughs> um, I think a few years ago, if, if you look, if you look at us, my sermon outline, the sermon outlines of talks I've done, yep. um, up until maybe five or six years ago, you'd see Jesus comes to Jerusalem. You know, um, yep. just totally. the, yep. the, that would be point two, and yep. uh, uh, Jesus cleans the temple or, or something like that. But then, if I think of um, state, explain, illustrate, apply. I, I, now, instead of saying Jesus clears the temple, verses 1 to 7, you'd have um, the application line and verses 1 to 7. And I'd actually be asserting the application line and then speaking to the text. Mm. Um, well, and it's, it's interesting, isn't it? So even there's a shift there, right? You might say instead of Jesus clears the temple, um, Jesus is zealously angry against sin. That's right. That changes the shape of that. Yeah, yeah. But you might even say Jesus is zealously angry about your sin. Yeah. Yeah. Or <laughs> he cares about us uh, not uh, being uh, sinful. Uh, uh, or, yeah. yeah like, <laughs> where, 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 whatever yeah. it is that you put in that space. Yeah. Um, I, and I think, Do, um, is again, that, right? that, I mean, that is absolutely right. And it's part of the, we're not just dealing conceptually, right? So, I think lots of people use illustrations to explain complex ideas or to make some things clearer. Illustrations are actually application. Mm -hmm. Illustrations are concrete for me nearly all the time. Illustrations are about this is what it looks like when you take these truths seriously and you start to put it into practice in your life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, this is what this is why this is beautiful. Let me tell you a story about mm. how this thing in real life, and how beautiful and good that is, and how thankful we are that God's given us this truth. Mm. Um, what do you? I mean, if you've come to a conviction and you're a senior teacher of 
future <laughs> theological... <laughs> well, I'm, I want to say I'm a future teacher of preachers and pastors who yeah. actually need to love people on the ground and bring the Word of God to bear. Yeah. yeah. What are you doing about it? Apart from advising me in this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, as at, at college over the last few years, we've been working really hard at uh, rewriting our curriculum. And part of that conversation has been how do we do more of getting students to engage with the problems of ministry life and bring the word to bear in those spaces rather than just kind of learning it as an academic exercise. Now, to be fair... I. If I'm honest with you, I don't think that my lecturers at college were any less committed to that as a thing. Um, I just think we've become more aware of perhaps our habits and the ways that that trains people. And we tended to do so like at college, you would write an exegetical paper on this passage. Mm -hmm. Now we say write an exegetical paper on this passage write a sermon outline, explain how you got from the exegetical work that you did to the sermon outline and why it matters. Mm -hmm. So we're actually trying to connect all of those dots mm -hmm. together for people rather than so that move them out into meek silos. It does also feel like learning styles. I mean, in terms of, I, I just remember thinking, if I want my sermon to connect with people with different learning styles, I can't just stay in... Um, in theoretician uh, kind of mode, that, I've, I've got to end up in application. And, and there's really a clear... Um, I'm just going to stop you there just briefly. Yeah. Um, learning styles may ping on some people in the education space. Uh -huh. Learning styles as a thing has been a little bit debunked in the education space oh, really? in the last little while. Like, okay. So there's like kinesthetic learners and yeah. auditory learners and visual learners and whatever. When you actually look at the information, it doesn't matter which one you are and which mode is used, that doesn't affect the outcome for students in terms of memory and learning. What does is if you use multiple modes together, everybody learns better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why do you think it's the case, or I think it's the case, that um, the Pentecostal church will have a... Uh, a congregation made up of a learning style that is different to the evangelical church. I'll just make that broad, classic, oh, uh, major assumption. Um, and, yeah. yeah. Uh, in God's kindness, it's not true everywhere, Dominic. But right. that, th I agree with the generalisation. Um, I think in part, um, it's partly to do with the difference between being um, a professional and a business runner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, Anglicanism has traditionally produced people who become professionals, not who run their own small business. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's partly to do with our educational background or whatever. When I do there, there's a lovely little thing that um, Kolb uses where he talks about adult learning is about having an experience, reflecting on it, thinking about how it fits with your worldview, trying something different and having a go and then starting again around the cycle. Mm -hmm. And you've got to go round and round. That's how we learn. Mm -hmm. That's how it works. Um, when I talk to students at university about that cycle and what they do, well, most of their learning is the sitting and thinking bit. Mm -hmm. And most of them have gotten to uni because they're particularly good at that mm, sitting yeah. and thinking bit. Like they've been predisposed. Some very intelligent people that I know who have found the schooling system very, very hard to navigate because the way that they function and engage mm. in the world is very different from the model of learning that we give people. Um, and I think that our churches, to some extent, um, reflect the cultures that we've been shaped by. You know. so how can we preach in such a way to appeal to a broader group of people than the narrow group we've been preaching to? Yeah. All, all I want to say is that if you believe that God's trying to show people the richness and goodness of living under Jesus as Lord and the whole of life under him, then you've got to preach the Bible in a way that you're not talking about an academic exercise. I don't want to tell you what Paul said to the Galatians. I want to tell you what God's saying to you. you. Yeah. Um, if we take that seriously, then we need to sit and engage with the text. And I haven't finished engaging with the meaning of the text until I've actually worked out what's this going to mean, shape, change, mould, do for the people that I'm speaking to because I think that that's God's purpose in terms of what the scriptures are doing. If I get to the end of my exegesis and think, right now I'm right to write a sermon outline, I haven't finished the task, is what mm. I would say. Do you find that... Um, I find it so difficult to get the actual meaning right that um, it's only when that I'm therefore squeezing out the thinking time about application 
but I also find that the, the magic happens in terms of me thinking about the people in the last 24 hours before the sermon. Mm. Whereas the work about understanding the text, in a sense, I can do any time, do you know? But it's actually the yeah, closer I, I get right. to the moment. But, but I think um, one of the things I, I, I would I was say different. about that, I mean, <laughs> but I, I would say that that last bit that you're doing is an essential element of yeah. actually bringing the text to bear and engaging with the meaning of the yeah. text. So John Frame in, does this lovely little thing where he says, imagine two people are talking about the Eighth Commandment, do not steal. Mm-hmm. And one of them goes, I actually think embezzlement that's included in that commandment. Another guy goes, no, that embezzlement's a different kind of thing. It doesn't fit under the commandment. They're not talking about some application of the commandment subsequent to the meaning. They are actually still talking about the meaning of the commandment as they talk about what they believe it means and does in the world mm-hmm. in front of them. So we actually need to believe that that part of the thinking and engagement that we do as preachers actually ought to drive us back into the text. We ought to be asking questions like, would the apostle who wrote this recognize what I'm saying to people in front of me as being a valid and helpful application of the truths that are here in the text that he was talking about, or would he not? Hmm. Even simply asking that question and then realizing we dig back. So in the last three weeks at college, with second year, I've been talking about our doctrine of sin. Mm -hmm. And this last week, we just looked at a whole heap of concrete scenarios about what we believe about how sin works. What do you do with sin in the life of a leader? Um, Because you believe in sinfulness, should you treat everyone with suspicion or should you assume um, incompetence Mm. rather than malice? Mm. um, As we talked about it, we realized it's not like when we got there, we had walked away from our doctrine of sin. That caused us to keep going back and thinking, well, what do we believe about sin? Where does the Bible say that? But we were talking about the concrete enacting of those things in life in the world. And that was part of actually digging deeply into and understanding richly the doctrine which we possess. Mm. And so I just want to keep saying to people, um, that bit where you think you're doing the application and it's supposed to be kind of subsequent to this, I think you can actually engage in it in a way that drives you back into the text and says, is this what the text is talking about? Does this cause me to see things in the text that I haven't seen yet? As I'm thinking about my people being spoken to by God through this text, how does that shape and mould? You can use that as part of the process of engaging deeply with the meaning of the text rather than being something that you do after you've gotten the first bit right. Mm. You've written a course to try and help people to do better in this. Well, my thesis um, was about actually trying to improve application in student preaching. So I had some volunteer fourth year students who came and did eight weeks with me as I tried to give them some theory and practical Mm -hmm. advice about what to do with it. And we surveyed them before and after and looked at results and whatever uh, and found significant shifts in terms of their behavior, in terms of time that they allotted to what kinds of activities in their preparation process, when they did what, how they engaged the text personally as well as um, thinking about their congregation, all of that kind of stuff. And you're going to turn that course into a book? Well, the plan, Dominic, is I have, in God's great kindness, more college gives me some study leave uh, every four years, and mine's the second half of this year. Uh, And God willing, pray, please. (laughs) Um, The aim is to try and turn this into something that's usable for people on the ground. I'm looking forward to it and benefiting from it. Yeah. Yeah. Paul Grimmond, thanks so much for coming in. Paul Grimmond has been my guest. He's the Dean of Students at Sydney's Moore Theological College. And uh, my name's Dominic Steele. You've been with us on The Pastor's Heart. We will look forward to your company next Tuesday afternoon.